Hi, and thank you for joining us with Ask the Experts. My name's Sarah Marie Cameron. I'm a presenter on the Triple M Network, but more importantly, an ambassador for Endometriosis Australia. And I am so excited to be part of this project this month. We're doing things a little bit differently this year for Endometriosis Awareness Month. We would normally be hosting high teas all over Australia, but unfortunately, not every single state can do the same thing right now. But that's okay. We'll be back in business next year, bigger and better than ever. But plenty ways that you can get involved with Endometriosis Awareness Month. You can wear yellow like myself. You can jump on board these Ask the Experts sessions, attend a high tea, maybe organise one yourself, or you can jump onto endometriosisaustralia.org.au for some more details. Now, our very first guest to join us with Ask the Experts is somebody who I think would have a thousand questions coming their way on a daily basis. Being a naturopath and somebody who is definitely part of our Endo Australia family is Tracy Gay Bisso, based in WA, joining me now via a wonderful internet connection on your side of things. How are you? I'm very good, thank you. I'm so glad that we get to have a chat today. I know that we could dive really deep on some complementary ways that we can try and deal with endometriosis and flare-ups and whatnot, but unfortunately we don't have all the time in the world, but I think there's a few things that we'll be able to have answers to today. Oh, hopefully, yeah. We definitely got a bunch sent through, um, but there's some key ones that let's just start with the basics. How can sure. complementary medicine and the, and the field that you work in help someone like myself who suffers with endometriosis and, you know, how can we try and use your field as a way to manage our day-to-day -day life and those big flare-ups that might happen? Yeah. Okay. Good question good starting question um, so I just want to define complementary medicine first because it can be a little bit of uh, um, people are not always sure what complement what fits into the complementary medicine field and what doesn't so really complementary medicine is an umbrella term for a range of um, therapies and modalities that are not considered to be um, the main stream if you like um, and there's really some key areas in complementary medicine. So it might be um, complementary therapies like massage or um, somebody yeah, using body work to support you, or there could be complementary remedies like herbal medicine, um, and there could be lifestyle interventions as well. So, but really as well with complementary medicine, if you're looking at things like acupuncture, which we would consider in Australia to be complementary medicine. If you're in um, China or somewhere like that, it could actually be a mainstream. So yeah. complementary medicine in Australia, really we're talking about anything that doesn't fall into the category of mainstream. So how we can help you um, would be, I would see as a part of a multimodality team um, to help you because we don't have all the answers the same as everybody else. So there would be certain therapies that we could use that might help you with some of the symptoms. So things like pain, and obviously with endometriosis, there's gonna be lots of different types of pain. Um, but we have with complementary medicine at our disposal, some body work that we could use. We have got herbal medicine we can use, as I say. And um, the main area that we would tend to work in would be pain relief. So we've got with complementary medicine as well, um, thousands of years of use of some of the herbs. So we might not have strong research in the, in the way that some of the drugs may have today, but we've got some traditional knowledge that we can utilize as well. And we look at trends to see what's happening um, and utilize those. So if you've got somebody with endo that's got a lot of pain, then they may have taken drugs, they may, um, be having surgery, but that may not always help them or, you know, fully. So we can add some things on that would help them um, afterwards as well. It might be some dietary changes. It could be some lifestyle um, things that they do, or it could be the use of those, those herbs and body therapies, those types of things. Like so that's where I see complementary medicine sort of yeah. like sitting as part of a multimodality team that help we all help each other. Team is key. Team, Absolutely. community, 
however you want to phrase it, because you're right, you don't have all the answers. Our general practitioner may not have all the answers, nor will our gynecologist either. So it definitely is a team and it's about putting that team together that works best for you. Now, one of the questions that we got, which I love from uh, somebody called Samantha. So thank you so much for sending that through, Samantha. She said, I want to know how to change my daily habits in order to better my life with this disease. I also hope to better understand it and better understand how to manage it. So what would you say are just some basic day-to-day -day stuff that we can do? Okay. So the first thing that we would um, maybe suggest for people is just to have, first of all, have a look at their diet. What are they doing with their diet? Are they having lots of sort of sugars and lots of processed foods? Um, are they having lots of foods that could be maybe increasing their inflammation? And then if that is the case and you start removing some of those foods or just changing how you eat, then that could make a difference in respect of, you know, your day-to-day -day life. There can also be things like um, mindfulness that um, can be quite useful for people. So we do know that with endometriosis, it can be obviously quite stressful for people. And um, just putting in some daily exercise or some mindfulness practices would be something that it doesn't have to be for, for an hour at a time. It can be five or 10 minutes, which can help to just calm the mind and give you a little bit of um, space to to sort of rest and give your body a little bit of a, of a rest. So maybe things like some mindfulness and lifestyle, um, some food choices. Exercise is going to be really important. And exercise itself is quite interesting because some people do get flare-ups with um, endometriosis when they do exercise. Exercise. So it depends what type of exercise um, they're doing. And for that, it might be useful to employ or to take on board um, some information from an exercise physiologist. Um, because even things like yoga, which we know has got some research behind to say that if you do it a couple of times a week for 90, I think it's 90 minutes for tw twice a week, it can be quite useful for information but not for everybody. Yeah. So um, you might need to have a specific um, exercise routine prescribed for you to help you with that but it's certainly something that you can do every day or a couple of times a week to help you manage um, that condition so it's it's sort of diet lifestyle relaxation and um, the other things can be obviously in decreasing things that may affect uh, liver function because we know that endometriosis is um, driven by oestrogen and oestrogen gets um, uh, uh, detoxified through the liver. So if you're doing things that can be detrimental to the liver, just by taking some of those things off, um, and again, it doesn't mean to say you have to give up drink, but it does mean maybe <laughs> that you um, don't go for too many benders um, too often, then that could maybe help with um, just reducing that inflammation information allowing the body to do what it's supposed to do and clear those estrogens through properly so little things like that um, there's self massage that can be done um, again you might need to get information on that from a massage therapist to start with but once you've got that information that's something that you can do at home when you're sitting there watching the television you can do some self massage when you've got your hot water bottle on there as well so just little things like that would probably be my recommendations to start with yeah, they're great little hints and tips. And, you know, when you mentioned things like yoga, that was one thing that I had so many people telling me to do very early yeah. on when I was diagnosed. And do you think I did it? <laughs> I wasn't doing yeah. it. And now eventually, you know, it, it just became something that I don't do it every day because I'm oh. not that great at practicing it. But I definitely yeah. do it multiple times a week. I can't do hot yoga, but I know other people who can no. do hot yoga. I get yeah. massive flare-ups if I go into a sauna or I do hot yoga. So that's a no-no yeah. for me. But then, yeah, I know other people that that's fine and they love it. Um, yeah. So, yeah. it's and that's, the, and that's the thing. Everybody is individual with endometriosis and, and individual anyway. So what suits one person is not going to suit the masses. Mm -hmm. So it's really important to try to work through with the professional what suits you and then you can then utilize that for the rest of the time so yeah that's what i love about working with professionals when you've got something like endo which is a chronic disease you did mention earlier about how complementary medicine doesn't necessarily have the same studies that western that's medicine right. does but you do have 
thousands of years of uh, tracking, you could say. So right. the question was sent through from Ashley and she wanted to know about some of those options that are available and evidence that is available for complementary medicine, which I know is difficult because it's hard to actually put together a study because you always need multiple groups and you need to have placebo yeah. and and yeah. the actual thing that you're testing and, and it's really hard to have those controlled environments so studies can be very difficult yes very difficult and um the thing as well is research the words research and the words evidence are quite different as well because a lot of people will use them interchangeably but um when we're looking at research we're looking at that in an investigation sort of way and then we use the the data that we get from that research to collate evidence to say yes this is really useful for the masses mm -hmm. and um the the data that we have is usually with complementary medicine is going to be more smaller studies or they might be test tube studies and then done on animals and then done on a few humans so there's this need to have these stronger studies in most of the things that we do but we do have some positive trends so we can use that data as well as the information from our um, you know from the history like the ayurvedic tradition and the traditional Chinese medicine tradition, add those together and say, well, clinically, we do see this happening. So this will be a place for us to start. And the things that we would start with that we've got that have got the most evidence with in complementary medicine would be things like acupuncture. So acupuncture is really useful for pain relief. And um, it can be there's been a couple of uh, reasonable studies on acupuncture in respect of having a couple of sessions a week for about eight weeks reducing the pain quite significantly um, the thing to say with acupuncture is it's important to get somebody again that's trained because there's a lot of people that do dry needling which may to the general public look the same and it it, it isn't so um it's, it's wonderful but they're not the same absolutely yes not the same so the research is all on the acupuncture at this stage so um we do know acupuncture is probably one of the things that we would recommend with the more evidence base um there's also exercise has got a reasonable amount of um research behind it not necessarily just for endometriosis but for general health overall for cardiovascular system for reducing inflammation or any inflammatory sort of diseases so exercise would be um something that we would use in that evidence based now in respect of herbal medicine we do have some smaller studies on um, more pain relief types of herbs so things like ginger and turmeric have got a reasonable amount of um, research behind them, but there's still a need to do bigger studies for longer periods of time on humans rather than animals and in the test tube. So um, ginger and turmeric, again, will fit into those traditional Chinese medicine and Ayurvedic um, practices as well. So we've got traditional knowledge for them, plus we've got reasonable amount of studies on those as anti-inflammatory and analgesics. So looking at pain, you would be utilizing some herbs um, like that. Mm -hmm. um, there's some nutrition that has got or some nutritional compounds that have started to get some studies coming through. Um, and that would be things like, and I'm gonna have to, I never say this right, so I'm gonna have to look at it because I wrote it down, I never say this right. It's palmitol ethylnolamide, or otherwise known as P, P-E-A. And that's basically a fatty acid made by the body. And um, this, there's about four, four or so studies on these that look at them work, it working as an anti-inflammatory and reducing some of the cells that release things like histamine, you know, that you get when you sort of like get your sinus problems and allergies and things like that. And we know for endo that histamine may be involved with increasing pain. So there's some studies to show that the PEA can be useful to help to reduce some of those inflammatory markers like his or those inflammatory compounds like um, like histamine. But again, smaller studies, not quite as robust as the ones that we want. So we need more studies on, on that as well. Of course. Now, in all of the things that you were just talking about and recommending there, I think for somebody who might be newly diagnosed with endometriosis mm -hmm. and they're currently looking for answers, what they might have just heard you say is money. You need a lot of money. Acupuncture uh -huh. costs money. Seeing a naturopath like yourself costs money. Buying That's herbs right. for your herbal tea costs money. 
And in amongst all of the wonderful questions that we were sent, um, a lot of people were asking, what are some things that we can do that are either inexpensive or free to try and yeah. manage endometriosis? Okay, so that's a really good question because we know that some of these therapies aren't available to everybody at this stage because there's no obviously government subsidy for them. Um, but there are some things that can be done easily at home. So I was talking about turmeric and ginger, first of all, mm -hmm. as a herbal that you would maybe buy from an naturopath in a strong sort of like extract. But you can use those as general spices in your everyday life. And so start cooking a bit more with, with foods like that, which have got those anti-inflammatory and anti-analgesic anti, um, sort of compounds in them. Or you can use, as I said, just changes in your diet, which doesn't have to be expensive. But the other thing that's quite useful to know is that a lot of these complementary therapy um, colleges have got student clinics. So the, the going to the student clinics are quite useful because the, the student clinics charge a minimum amount and you're supervised by, by practitioners who are really experienced. Um, so you've got the, the students taking the case, but then you've got the, the, um, the experienced practitioner that will oversee that case. And you, know, can, you can sometimes get a, a massage for $25 and see in a naturopath for $25. So that's not too expensive initially to get some information, um, but adding in those herbs into your everyday life. Um, and with acupuncture, yes, it is, it is more expensive than um, some other things, but they, there are some private health fund rebates for acupuncture and massage as well. So it's utilising those if you've got them. Um, but it's, yeah, it's really just doing some little things, as I say, on an everyday basis, the exercise, the lifestyle, the herbs in the everyday um, life, and then using those natural therapy colleges if you want that extra bit. That's what I would suggest at this stage. Yeah. The tip about the colleges is actually really great for going and seeing students who are training for traditional Chinese medicine. Allied Health as well. You can go to those universities. That's, that's great. So back in the day when I was a university student, I used to go to the hairdressing colleges and get my hair done. Fantastic. <laughs> I know, that's what I mean. And you've got, I see it as you get the benefit of, because there's usually two, with the naturopathic college, there's at least two students. So you get the benefit of two people. Plus yeah. you've got the experienced um, practitioner that's overseen it. So you've got three people's brains working out your condition for you for a lot less money. Yeah. Um, well, I'm not saying that to stop you coming to see me. <laughs> um, but obviously, you know, we need to, to give people choices so that you've got... Um, choices for people so that they can afford some of these things for sure. Absolutely. It would be nice if you've got some government subsidies at some stage, that would be cool. <laughs> Wouldn't it? Can we please have some? Yeah. Um, and please. if I may add a tip as well, something that is completely free, I mean, provided that you've got your internet connection, be it on your phone or, or maybe at home, I do all of my yoga at home and get the videos off of YouTube. Fantastic, yeah. yeah so I just want to in pelvic stretch 10 or 15 minutes what however long i have or if i've got half an hour i do the same for my workouts as well because i understand it is such a financial strain living yeah, this yeah. life with an invisible illness a disease that yeah. we will have for the rest of our days it's really expensive and you've got to find ways around it so i put my hand up and say that i use youtube and i get all the free videos i can okay. yeah um, I think the thing with that is to make sure that the people that are doing it are qualified the other end. If oh, you've yeah. got somebody who's qualified, absolutely, um, yeah, use that, utilise that as well, for sure. 100%. You can jump on, search, look up some people, and you'll end up finding some people that, you know, you like their vibe and you That's can it. have a look at their videos, which is a lot of fun. Now, another free thing that you can do is switch up your diet and just change the things that you're eating, which you've said. There's always been a lot of chatter about the benefits of going low FODMAP and I okay. follow a low FODMAP diet. There are some things that I've introduced back into my diet because I did the yeah. hardcore low FODMAP for a couple of months and then I started introducing different foods and figuring out okay. what it was that set me off and I was able to notice for myself, I was able to say, okay, this does not work. I cannot have this food. So I guess I'm low FODMAP plus the food that I've reintroduced through that process. Yeah. What are your thoughts on following a low FODMAP diet? 
Um, I think there's a reasonable amount of research behind it now, um, especially if the women with endometriosis have got um, some bowel conditions, as in, you know, they get in the bloating and that type of stuff every month, which, you know, can be uncomfortable. Um, and it's definitely something that uh, I encourage for people with the endometriosis plus they've got the irritable bowel type sy symptoms as well. Yeah. However, as you said, it is a tricky diet to do long term because some of the foods that you're removing um, are very nutritious. So um, FODMAPs basically is uh, all about fer fermented carbohydrates. So some of those carbohydrates are some of your good, um, you know, vegetables and things like that. So you don't want to leave them out for too for too long because um, then you've got you know you've got then to to weigh up well i might get in everything nutritionally so it's definitely something that i would do uh, short term like you say um, now how a naturopath would approach that slightly differently would be they would add in while you're taking the foods out they would add in possibly some soothing herbs to actually calm the um, digestive system down a little bit so that you're more likely to be able to start adding those foods back in. Um, so then that's how, you know, a naturopath would probably benefit you from doing the FODMATs um, alongside them. Um, but yes, definitely do it short term and then do exactly as you have done. Start reintroducing one at a time and then assessing individually for you what, you know, you're going to be able to keep out because do you want to keep out a food that you really enjoy that's, you know, you feel quite passionate that it's a beautiful food long term um, when you, if you put it back in, it actually might not be causing you too much issue now once you've actually taken it out for a while. So definitely a useful tool to use and the research is, is showing it does help quite a few women with endometriosis now, um, but it, it's not an easy diet to do long-term and it's not one that I would recommend long-term. It's more of a short-term one, reintroduce and um, then assess individually, as you've said. Absolutely. And, you know, with myself, I've had multiple surgeries around and on my bowel as well. So there's other things that I'm playing with. I'm not just now dealing with endometriosis, I'm dealing with scar tissue as well from the amount of surgeries that I've had. So there's other symptoms that I'm trying to work around too. Uh, but I do know that that is something that some endometriosis sufferers have to deal with. And at the end of the day, Absolutely. it'll grow wherever it wants to grow. And you've just got to try and look after those areas of your body. Um, but I'm pretty sure we're all very well aware of um, hearing the pouch of Douglas. <laughs> it's probably like, oh, yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I have thoroughly enjoyed having a chat with you and uh, getting to go through some of these questions. I think you've summed up a lot of the things that we can do for a long-term look at endometriosis. There's not really a quick fix, but before no. we wrap this up, if there, if there was sort of an intervention that you could suggest for those bad flare-ups, the ones where you are just in so much pain at home, are there any hot tips that you just want to get out there from your side of things that you think, you know, work wonders for the people that you see? I'm a traditional um, naturopath. So I would use things like um, ginger poultices on the stomach area. Ginger. So like a ginger juice, like I was saying to you, ginger, there's some research for ginger, but a lot of people will take that internally. I would use that on like a flannel a hot flannel and put that over the area when you get the flare up. Ah, oh, I love it. <laughs> so you just squeeze the um, ginger juice and, and sort of like put it into a little bit of warm water and then you get a flannel and you would soak that into that and then just lay with that over the, um, the tummy area if that's where the pain is. Um, and in the old days, they used to use things like castor oil packs as well, which you can add castor oil, which is quite soothing mm -hmm. to that area as well. But you wouldn't do it when you had your actual period. It would be during the month leading up to. So I think they, those types of topical applications can be quite soothing instantly. Um, and I would probably use herbs as well internally at the same time, because some of the things like ginger and turmeric will work quite quickly. But the hot poultices, um, 
are, there's no re real research now, um, you know, in the way that they want the research to be nowadays about it, but it's definitely something that traditionally has come through with using topical treatments. And I know Ayurvedic medicine uses lots of topical treatments and it's quite quick. It's easy to do in your home because you usually people would have a flannel and if you're cooking stir fries, you've always got ginger in there. So I would yeah. be using something like that, which is a little bit different. That is the best tip I've heard in such a long time. I love it. I'm getting ready to juice some ginger and have that ready on standby for the next flare up. Where can people find you online if they want to follow you or get in touch with you? Sure. So my website is www.beyondhealth.com.au. Um, and yeah, you'll find me on there. And I do practitioner mentoring and I do actually supervise at one of the naturopathic colleges as well. Um, <laughs> and um, yeah, you'll mainly find me there and you'll be able to find me at my clinics online on that website. Wonderful. Tracy gave me so it was so lovely to chat to you as always. We are unbelievably thankful to have you part of the Endometriosis Australia family and assisting and giving out this information. Also, if people want to listen to you having a chat with the wonderful Ellie Angel Bobs, who is also an ambassador with Endometriosis Australia, she's got the Living with Endo podcast, which you can get from all good podcasters. Have a listen to your episode and all the others that are up there. Thank you so much for joining me on. Uh, getting to go through a couple of these questions that I know so many endo warriors are going to appreciate. So thank you. No worries. Thank you very much for your time. And as always, if you want any more details or any facts or you want to get in contact, endometriosisaustralia.org and you can help continue raise awareness for this invisible illness. Mm -hmm.